we've all seen the events on the news, screaming to us that something bad has happened. Each event and each disaster had a set of circumstances and reasons for why they happened, what went wrong, and what led up to the accident. But what happens after these accidents, the aftermath, is the story most people don't hear about. Cover-ups, devastation, heartbreak, and battles that rage on to ensure that the right thing is done and the responsible parties are held accountable. Big companies have an army of powerful attorneys. The only way to beat them is by having more powerful attorneys. Too often, the right thing is never done. Responsible parties are not held accountable. Nothing changes to prevent future catastrophes. That was until Kurt Arnold and Jason Itkin stepped onto the scene. They forced corporate practices to change forever. Being a trial lawyer is the only profession where you have the ability to take a mega corporation, a Fortune 500 corporation, and make them change their ways. I hate seeing people get taken advantage of. They're, it's something that bothers me to the core, and I really hate bullies. You think you can't get surprised, and then you hear something else, and you're like, yeah, they really, I, that really happened. They really did that. Let me give you an example. A reboiler explodes, causes a massive explosion, kills two, injures more than 100, for $2, it would have prevented this entire explosion. Mad doesn't even begin to, to, to say the right type of, of feelings. I mean, I'm a little cynical. Like, I've seen like companies do this. Like, they do it all the time. It's a big oil company. I kind of expect them to do it. These clients would become your friends who you talk to every day, and you're like, you love them, but you wish they never had to call you. It's always a common denominator. The insurance company is trying to find a way not to pay. When they can pay a grieving widow as little as possible, it's like them scoring a touchdown. You hear the defense lawyer stand up in front of you and say crazy things. They say things that you don't think are true. Talk about how they're never going to lose. Um, and my answer to that is like, okay, well then we don't need to talk. The worst thing that you can do is probably tell us no. You make a little note in your head and it's like, this is where it went wrong for the bad guys. On April 20th, 2010, the Deepwater Horizon exploded in the Gulf of Mexico, killing 11 workers, causing the largest marine oil spill in history. This is the real story of some of those on board. What happened in the Deepwater Horizon was that initially there was so much attention. It was on the news every day, and there was the you know counter that said how many barrels of oil had spilled into the Gulf of Mexico. But eventually they stopped the, the oil from spilling, and the news cycle did what the news cycle does. There was a new story. Everybody remembers the BP oil spill that you know covered the coast of Louisiana and the Gulf Coast states. But what really uh, was the most important thing that happened is what happened to the injured crew members and those that were, lost their lives. I want to update the American people on the status of the BP oil spill, a catastrophe that is causing tremendous hardship in the Gulf Coast, damaging a precious ecosystem, and one that led to the death of 11 workers who lost their lives in the initial explosion. Deepwater Horizon was hands down the worst uh, maritime catastrophe uh, in the history of the United States. It didn't take long for Kurt and I uh, to recognize the enormity of this case, the importance of this case. Calls started coming from across the country from different crew members in different roles and assignments throughout the rig. And ultimately, they needed help because their company had turned their back on them. I know that you are working very hard to find those 11 missing uh, workers. Uh, they are the 11 that are not accounted for. So 126, I believe, were rescued. Uh, 11 are missing. Wh how, what's the, where's the search for them? How is that being concentrated? Uh, search is con it's still concentrated primarily ar around the uh, rig. It has expanded somewhat uh, by several square miles, obviously, with some currents. Uh, weather conditions out there right now are favorable for our search. Um, and we have, you know, we've had helicopters out there. We've had a couple of cutters uh, at a time out there. We, we continue. As long as the Coast Guard feels there's a, a probability that they're still alive, we're going to continue searching. 
It was a Transocean rig and primarily Transocean crew that had been sent on site to, to drill a BP well. But ultimately what it came down to is that BP ignored the warning signs of the terrible pressure that was unleashed on the rig that ultimately caused it to explode because they were trying to get the well completed and they had a schedule and they were behind schedule and they put money uh, over the safety of the crew. You know, next thing you know, while everybody's focused in on, you know, congressional hearings and, you know, late night news, Transocean was going through and, and minimizing its liabilities. The 193-page report is quite literally a catalog of errors. As oil and gas started pouring up the well, it took 40 minutes for the crew to notice. By the time they did, the flammable mixture wasn't diverted over the side, but through a separate system that carried it onto the rig. This meant the oil and gas clouded potential ignition sources on the rig. As a result, fire prevention systems were overwhelmed, and it's thought flammable gas was sucked into the engine rooms where it ignited. At one moment, you're going about your day, you're doing your job, you're working hard, and the next minute, you know everything around you is on fire. Loud noises, explosions, heat everywhere. You don't know who's alive, who's dead. You have nowhere to go, nowhere to run, because you're stuck literally in the middle of the ocean. And all you want to do is, is, is get in touch with your loved ones. You want to get to safety. But instead of letting that happen, they kept these people up for days at a time, locked them in a hotel room, and would not let them go until they gave a statement or until they tried to force them to sign a release. Kurt Arnold is a lawyer for some of the workers. He joins us now. Kurt, how soon after the explosion are you saying company, the company tried to get these workers to sign these waivers? Good evening, Anderson. What you really need to understand is that the, the litigation machine took place right away. That most of these uh, survivors were uh, on a boat that should have gone to shore, but instead they kept them out right by the drilling rig, watching the fires essentially where uh, their friends had, had, had perished and were missing. And they kept them there so that I think that they could get their litigation machine uh, essentially in place. And so they get to shore 48, 40 to 48 hours after the accident. And before they can go home, and before they can even go see the doctor of their request, they're asked to sign a statement saying uh, that the prepared statement by uh, uh, an insurance adjuster saying that uh, they're not injured. The first thing they do after every one of these events is do what they did here. They go to the widow that's not represented by a lawyer, or they go to the injured crew member who has no idea what his future is or what his medical treatment is, and they offer him a little bit of money. And they would go to individuals and they prey upon Hey, you're a company guy. You've been with us a long time. We're going to take care of you. We're all in this together. Let us throw a concert. People were saying, Kurt, I don't know what to do. The company says they're going to take care of me. And I said, just wait. Here's my cell phone. A few weeks later, Transocean sends out a letter to every one of their injured crew members. And it says, we will give you six months pay. You will give a release of BP, Transocean, Halliburton, every defendant involved. You will not file a lawsuit in exchange for six months pay, which in most cases was fifty or $60,000. And if you don't, your employment with us is terminated. I mean, can you imagine being hurt on the deep water horizon and signing away your life for fifty dollars or $80,000? Right? These are guys who are making $100,000, $150,000 a year. It's not even six months wages. It's insulting. What? Transocean's ultimate goal was, and BP's ultimate goal was, was how do we save a few dollars? That's when they got more aggressive. The head of British Petroleum pulls no punches on his initial reaction to this disaster. I initially, I was very shocked. I was angry. We understand that BP has interviewed the crew of this oil rig. What have they told you about the circumstances and the, and the conditions that night on the, on the oil rig? Uh. I think we, uh, it's far too early in the investigative process to speculate on uh, the events and what, what transpired. It was so crazy. These are people that are really hurt, like hurt really bad. And Transocean sent them a letter and said, you need to get back to work. And if you don't get back to work, we're going to fire you. They told me that they no longer pay for my wages and I'd have to go back to work. If not, then it was pretty much out of luck. 
You know, you work for a company for 20 years, you don't think they're trying to screw you. It's a trick, it's a scam, it's a way for them to save money and escape responsibility for what they've done. They were constantly trying to, um, to get me back to work as quickly as they could. I, I realized at that point that I could not at that time go back offshore and still to this day don't know that I ever could. And so when Kurt and I saw what happened to the workers on the horizon, we knew that not only did we have to make it right for them, we had to make sure that we improved safety industry-wide. And so we started, small town by small town, going and seeing them, sitting in their kitchen. I worked on a third of the crew members' cases, including uh, the death, one of the 11 death cases from that case. The president was calling people, trying to meet with survivors, and then there was dealing with the defense lawyers. And they sent down a team of what they called high-powered negotiators. And they thought that these fancy negotiators would somehow uh, intimidate us. And we looked them in the eye and said, we'll see your team in court. Get ready, here we go. So we, would, we were pushing for trials. Uh, we were pushing for priority for our clients. First and foremost, I told the court the most important thing is you must take care of the families of the crew members. They are the ones that are hurting from this the most. It's not an economic claim, it's not an environmental claim, it's their livelihoods. One of the ways that BP and Transocean defended itself in this lawsuit was to try to rely on an ancient, outdated law that basically said that if you get hurt or you get killed on water, working on the water, then you have less rights than someone that gets hurt or killed working on the land. And so BP and Transocean said, we're going to avoid doing the right thing. We're going to avoid taking responsibility for the lives we've ruined by hiding behind this law from the 1800s. And we said, that's not right. We were in Congress uh, lobbying. We were up there, I mean, we were representing uh, families who'd just been blown up by uh, just some of the worst practices around. On the other side of our cases, you have to remember that generally they have unlimited resources. Was there pressure? Yeah, but the pressure's good. I mean, the pressure keeps you focused, like razor focused on getting the right result. For me to do my job, right, I've got to put enough pressure on the company. They say, we don't care what it costs, make it go away. And then we, uh, gathered all the facts, gathered all the evidence, took all the depositions, and put together to show why it was that these greedy decisions put uh, profits over safety, killed many, and put all these other crew members at risk. Ultimately, for our clients, we were able to get the highest settlements in the country, the largest U.S. settlement for somebody who lost their life offshore in U.S. history. And the other crew members got the largest settlement in history, certainly the largest in the Deepwater Horizon, because at the end of the day, uh, we weren't interested in their overtures in the beginning. We were interested in ensuring that we discovered the truth, and we were interested in making sure that our clients were taken care of forever. The company has agreed to pay $4 billion to settle all criminal claims, a fine more than three times higher than the previous record payment made by the drug company Pfizer in 2009. After the Deepwater Horizon, it showed that our firm is up here and everybody else is down here. On June 13th, 2013, in a small town of Geismar, Louisiana, a reboiler exploded at the Williams Olefins chemical plant. Two workers ended up losing their lives, and over 100 were injured. This is the aftermath of that accident. An explosion and fire at a Louisiana chemical plant killed at least one person and sent at least 75 others to area hospitals. The plant is south of Baton Rouge. People in the area were told to stay indoors and to avoid exposure to potentially toxic smoke. It's a regular work day, regular morning, getting up, going to work. I got my welding stuff together and everything to get ready to make the well and uh, waited about nine o'clock break. And uh, by then um, I got up to go to where my tools were. Next thing you knew, you see fire, people running, falling over things, people howling, crying. Run for your life or I'll get your life taken. There's no warning, no nothing. 
It's kaboom. We're asking anybody to stay away from this area of LA 30 around the Iberville Ascension Parish line. So we're having each of the contractors do a head count of their personnel to determine if anybody's been missing. That's ongoing. So no report of fatalities. We do know that there's injuries. There are some people that have been transported to the burn unit of Baton Rouge. Uh, General, I do not know the extent of those injuries. I was on the ground and somewhat um, trampled over when I was trying to escape the flames. I was thrown back several feet into a beam and um, was trampled over. Coworkers, uh, everybody scared, panicked. I had three family members in there worried about my life and theirs too. I just remember just to, just remember the fire being over my head and the, the loud noise and the people scattering for their life. The Williams plant explosion is a perfect example of companies taking shortcuts. People were not from scaffolding. People were not down in all different types of ways. Uh, it, was a, it was a terrible event. And so not soon after uh, that explosion did I start getting phone calls. Uh, hey, can you help me? We filed the case, we start doing our discovery, and uh, Williams was very aggressive, saying that we're never gonna pay these cases, and uh, we, we proceeded ahead, and we're, we're very aggressive with determining the truth about what happened. Unfortunately, Williams Company, one of the largest companies in the world, chose to take shortcuts because they wanted just to move faster, they wanted to be more profitable. They didn't care about the workers at the plant. We demanded to inspect the scene. So we got an order that we can go inspect the scene, we can preserve the evidence, we brought our experts. Uh, and then we started taking depositions. And so here's what I discovered, is that for nearly 10 years, the thing that allowed the reboiler to overpressure had been identified as a serious hazard. A serious hazard that was ranked as classified at the highest level could cause serious injury or death. It had been assigned to a manager for over 10 years to fix the very problem that occurred on the day of the explosion. For $2, it would have prevented this entire explosion. And he continuously ignored the recommendation over the next 40 meetings. Even though the pre-startup safety review document was incomplete and there were questions that were not answered, management approved the form. And the end result was these reboilers were put into service without adequate overpressure protection. It literally was getting out of your chair, walking down and getting your relief seal, putting it on and noting it on the checklist. And they didn't care. At the time, uh, my boy was about five, six, to see a kid like that, with, he pretty much had to, you know, uh, become a man earlier than his time cleaning up, helping me with certain things, helping me put my shoes on or whatever, uh, learning how to cook somewhat, you know? So uh, it it uh, it took a toll on me because uh, I'm putting my son in a position that he don't deserve to be in. A couple of people died. A lot of people got burned, a lot of injuries. Two people dead, more than 100 injured. All of our clients had their employers turn their backs on them. Many of them had that were gotten laid off and they were denied medical care. That was it, so if you was hurt, pretty much it was just a, another number to them. They could easily replace you. They worked hard for their companies, their companies paid them well, they thought, my company will take care of me. The very first thing they did is they immediately called claims, risk management, and a crisis legal team. And a crisis legal team, people don't even know these exist. But there are lawyers that are on standby for plant accidents. Couldn't sleep. You can't, you can't do nothing. Your life is changed. I was a very active person. And when all that is taken from you, you can't do nothing. It's like I'm a whole different person. Loss of, loss of wife, lost friends, family members don't even speak to you really. Your phone stop ringing. Nobody want to be bothered with you. Our clients aren't just, aren't just pieces of paper. They're not just a file. Our clients are real people, real people whose lives have been forever turned upside down, real people that need help. You know, if you throw a ball through a window, you fix the window. If you knock over somebody's vase, you fix the vase. Uh, 
you fix the harm you caused, even if it's expensive. Um, and I thought, well, maybe they're getting the message. Maybe they're going to do what's right. The company, uh, despite this terrible, one of the worst explosions in the history of Louisiana, uh, they didn't care. The plant was so, you know, they were just so devious about how they was trying to go about. It's almost like they were trying to do like a cover up on things that transpired. And when Williams thought they were going to win and they thought they couldn't get beat, Kirk proved them wrong. We prepared the case and we were totally ready for trial. At, at the last minute, Williams invited us to a, a settlement meeting and asked me to fly over and meet with them. Um, and I, I did. And it was at that time that they told me at a fancy steakhouse that they would never offer anything for our clients. And so from that forward, I said, that's fine. We don't need to have any settlement talks. And we went down, we moved into the hotel, we got our war room set up. And for the next three and a half weeks, uh, we brought it to Williams at trial. You got some lions with only Hickens. They're not gonna, they're not gonna back down. You know, even when I had to do my um, my testimony in court, you know, they didn't let those lawyers run over me. They fought hard, man. They know that they're gonna have to pay the Arnold and Hickens premium. They're gonna have to pay more for our clients' cases than they've ever paid before. They know that no matter what happens, we won't stop until the truth comes out. It was like a kid having a, a bully, and someone steps in and stands up to that bully and said that, no, you're not gonna bully this person no more. They step in and they help you. I was able to actually witness them in court. You know, they, they went in there like straight bulldogs, and they won. I am a bicycle solo when I was like eight years old, and I remember my mom going to get it back. I felt like that again. Yeah, mom, you know, my school back. You know, nobody do that for you. You know, and then I grow up, all this happens to me. And Kirk gets up there, and Jason's talking for me. I'm like, yeah, what he said. Uh, we battled them day in and day out. It was on every front. There was nothing that they were conceding. Uh, I remember sitting at a council table and looking to my left, looking at the council table and looking all the way back to the galley, and they had 42 lawyers on their case. And then I looked to my client, and it was me and my client. And my client said, there's a lot of lawyers over there. I said, it's OK. It's David versus Goliath. We're right. We're going to win. The longer they fight, the worse it's going to get. Because no matter what obstacles get put in our way, no matter what roadblocks they try to put to stop us from getting our clients the best results, no matter what they try to do, we will fight them to the end and get our clients the very best future. And what it took was nearly a couple hundred million dollars and twice as much as what it would have taken uh, before we had these verdicts. But that's, what, that's why having trial lawyers matters. It was actually one of the uh, greatest accomplishments I feel as a lawyer to have a case where if they hired our firm, they were taken care of for life. On September 29th, 2015, the Elfaro was ordered to set sail from Jacksonville despite the risks of sending a rusted 40-year-old ship into the path of the Category 4 hurricane. On October 1st, all communications between the El Faro and the shore ceased. Families of 33 crew members missing after their cargo ship sank during Hurricane Joaquin are holding out hope that their loved ones will be found alive. We are still looking for survivors or any signs of life, any signs of that vessel. Uh, we are still doing that. So the search for survivors continues. Those pains, you know, when I was in denial, when I found out that the ship was missing, I was still hoping that he will still be able to come back home. All my thoughts were just maybe, maybe he's just stranded in one of the islands in the Bahamas. And one day he will call me and let him know that he's all right. We are assuming that the vessel has sank. Uh, we believe it sank in, in the last known position that we recorded on Thursday. The aircraft, how many ships have been looking and the high technology they've been using and scanning that search area over and over and over again and not finding any sign of survivors. You add that up, that grim equation gives you a kind of finish line. And unfortunately, they crossed it about 45 minutes ago when this search and rescue effort officially ended on the part of the Coast Guard. As the days goes by and the Coast Guard gave up their search, I was so desperate and lost. 
And especially when they found out that the ship was 15,000 feet down below. They would have been abandoning ship into a Category 4 hurricane. So you're talking up to 140 mile an hour winds, seas upwards of 50 feet, visibility basically at zero. Those are challenging conditions um, to survive in. I still feel the pain remembering those days. My husband, who was a merchant seaman, died at sea, drowned. And I needed someone experienced enough to get answers for the families of the crew members. Man, I told the lawyers when they called right in the beginning. They said, um, we would like to discuss resolution. I said, no way. I said, I have promised to find the truth about what happened. And so until I find the truth, until I can satisfy my clients that we've uncovered every rock and we know everything that happened that day, we're not interested. Kurt and I um, received phone calls after a, a cargo ship called the El Faro sank because its owners had sailed it into a hurricane. And when you, when you hear that, like, how does that happen? My husband was on the FRO ship. It was just me and my son left. It's like, I was just depending on him so much for so many things. Like I say, he was a provider. It was a lot that changed um, in my life because he wasn't there anymore. A part of my life left. Miss Terry Hargrove called me. I said, Terry, let's not do this on the phone. Let me come to your house. And I remember going and sitting in her house and she'd been married to her husband since 25 and he was then 66 when he passed. No children. It was just uh, Terry and Joe. And she had I mean, so much pain. I mean, she can't even talk about it. I mean, she can't even articulate it. My husband, Joe, was a very quiet man. He was shy, but, but strong. He liked having fun. He, um, he was serious about his job. He just liked to fish and be with his family. I sat next to the chair that he always sat in, almost as if he was in the room with us. Very difficult, um, because in her life, Joe was everything, and Terry wanted justice. You killed somebody, sailed them into a hurricane, and you're gonna put a formula on how you value their life? That just, that, that wasn't gonna work for us. And I told him, I said, guys, we want to discover the truth. We don't even wanna talk money. Okay, but when we do, it is gonna be so much more. There's no point in y'all even sitting down right now because there's no amount of money that y'all can pay to take care of these families. And what y'all are thinking is the right thing is not the right thing, I, I can assure you that. That money, I mean, it will stop me from there. You know, I'd like to know. I'd like to further find out what, what's going on, what happened. You know, I know to, I would like to find the truth. I don't have any peace of mind. I won't be able to sleep in the night knowing that if I accept that money and I will be silenced forever, it's not right. Meanwhile, they have filed a limitation action in federal court in Jacksonville to try to limit their liability for 33 deaths to $15 million. And then the limitation letter came. And that really take a toll on my emotions and feelings and... And when the owners of the El Faro filed what's called a limitation act, an attempt to use an 1850s law to limit their liability, a law that was put in place when we didn't have radar, when we didn't have weather reports, when we didn't have ships that could be put together with advanced machinery and advanced engines that could avoid them from being from sinking, there's only one thing we can do, and that's fight. Fight no matter what to make it right. I was angry. I was like, what's going on? What happened? What happened to my husband? Why do they? It seems like somebody had put him to a condition where there's no point of return. 
I just knew that we were reporting to the Siemens Hall to get answers, and we were getting very few answers. So many questions about what happened here. I mean, we, we know that the, the last words that we understand at this point from the ship, we, we are now sailing, uh, sailing into it. We are in the middle of it. And, and the question is, why? Why were they? The ship's owner is speaking out, refusing to answer some crucial questions about why the ship was there in the first place. What more are you learning about the captain right. and the company that owned the ship? Yeah, Tote uh, Marine is the company that owns this vessel. We were over there for that press conference. Well, it wasn't a press conference. It was a statement. They refused to take any questions from reporters, despite all of us asking a lot of them. And there are many to be had. Well, the NTSB had a briefing tonight, and they said that they spent a long time today talking to the captain of the El Yunque. Now, this is interesting because the El Yunque is the sister ship of the El Faro. They're said to be almost identical. And the captain of the El Yunque also served on the El Faro, so he could paint a very good picture of the El Faro for the NTSB. He also could probably paint a very good picture of Tote Marine, the parent company, because there have been allegations that perhaps the company pressured the captain of the El Faro to sail despite the hurricane, and also that the company may have shaved some financial corners when it came to maintenance of the vessels. He definitely says that ship was showing its age. Here's what he told me. This ship is old. It's, if, if you look at the inside of the deck on the second level, it's rusted to death. It's rust everywhere. Only thing we do is mask the problem. We paint over rust. We'll chip rust, but it's so much rust. It's just, it's hard to conceal what it really is. It's a rust mud. Putting somebody on a 40-year-old ship, putting crew members on a 40-year-old ship, they should have to consider the safety first of the crew before doing business. It's only in a court of law in front of a judge and a jury where you can take some giant company that bullies people, that mistreats people, that hurts people on purpose just to make money. It's only in a court of law where you have the power as an individual or as a trial lawyer to make them responsible and accountable to people. And when I figured that out, I knew I had to be a trial lawyer because it was the only way that I knew that I could help people who'd been taken advantage of, who'd been hurt, who'd lost loved ones because of the way these companies act. The way people get is they don't see the person who was killed or the family that was hurt. They don't see them as family or a person where something really bad has happened. They just, they, 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 they're a number. They're just a, a, a number on a file. Reviewing the transcripts show Captain Michael Davidson kept El Faro on course in the middle of Hurricane Joaquin after crew members twice suggested he change course. Apparently the ship had been taking on water since about three in the morning, but no one knew it. At 6.54, Captain Davidson says, it's miserable right now, and he discusses flooding in three-hold, a significant amount. Then he says, quote, everybody's safe right now. We're not going to abandon ship. We're going to stay with the ship. We are in dire straits right now. Seven minutes later, the captain declares a marine emergency on the ship-to-shore phone. It was 7.01. Finally, at 7.29, Davidson says, all right, let's go ahead and ring it. Ring the abandoned ship. Two minutes later, he's yelling, everybody, everybody, get off, get off the ship, stay together. And I remember going to mediation and uh, two CEOs were there, said that they were sorry, that you know, one of them even cried. And for a moment, you might've believed them. And then it was offers that were offensive to me. Other lawyers took them apparently, but I wasn't gonna take them and our clients weren't gonna take them. This is the kind of lawyers that I need you know, the kind of lawyers that will fight for my rights. Fight not only for my rights, but for my husband. I don't want his life to be wasted. I don't want his life to be of no meaning at all. And we told our clients, these widows, stand by us, trust us. No matter what, we're not gonna let you down. And we fought for them, and we kept pushing and pushing until our clients received the very most amount of money of anyone in the El Faro. Kurt looked the owners of the company in the eye, looked their insurance company in the eye, and he would not back down until they made it right. Tote Maritime files this notice with the courts to show the company has finally settled the final three cases with crew members' families. A major step for the shipping company, putting El Faro's tragedy behind them legally.
Mildred, Tanisha, Terry and I got them to the point where they paid the appropriate settlements that took care of the families forever. And we discovered the truth for our clients so that they could have peace of mind knowing that they had stood up to the company, they discovered what really happened, not what was reported, and by ensuring that they got very large settlements that took care of them for a life, it also made the insurance company internalize the cost of doing wrong. And I think that every one of my ladies was more proud of they made it more likely this would never happen again than they were about the monetary part of their settlement. We had a bond, you know, over the 18 months. We, we all became a family. Even when I wanted to give up, Kurt was like, we got you, we got you. See, I told him that, like, Kurt, you're my hero. You're my knight in shining armor. Because that's how I feel towards him, you know? Like, he's there to protect me, to, I feel so safe, you know? So when people talk about what's your job, to me, it's not as much of a job as it is almost it's a calling. It's something that I feel like I have to do. It's something that it's part of who I am. And so being a trial lawyer, it's not like I have to go to work every day. It is what I get to do every day. It's a privilege to me. It's an honor to me. Being able to represent the families, the trust they put in me to make it right, it's, I couldn't do anything else. Every day, companies cut corners to increase profits. And compromises are made without regard for human life. Imagine for a moment what these companies would get away with. There weren't people strong enough to stand up to them. Their families, the aftermath is a place filled with tears, pain, loss, and suffering. For these companies, it's a place filled with cover-ups, litigation machines, and deceit. With all of that emotion and confusion, Companies resort to formulas to solve people's problems. They arrogantly assume that the wronged family will hire any attorneys they come across. And the company fully expects they are not capable of winning. The playbook safely reads, they're ready to move on as if nothing happened. Prepared for victory, everything changes when they read. This client is represented by Kurt Arnold and Jason Itkin. The playbook quickly changes. Hire more attorneys, hire better attorneys, bring in the big guns, warn executive team about future loss of significant revenue, play nice, try not to say no, cross fingers. When companies do wrong, they have a chance to make it right. When they don't, Kurt and Jason will be there.